So today we're going to talk about surgical approaches and fixation options for both bone forearm fractures. And we're first going to discuss the volar approach to the radial shaft. Uh, later we will talk about the dorsal approach to the radial shaft. The classic volar approach to the radial shaft is through the Henry approach. And the first thing that should be done is with the patient supine and the arm extended on a hand table with the forearm supinated is identify the two landmarks for the superficial skin incision, which proximally are the biceps tendon and distally are the FCR tendon or the uh, radial styloid themselves. So if you take a marking pen and draw a straight line between the biceps tendon and the FCR where it crosses the uh, flexion crease of the wrist, that line will be the superficial skin incision for the volar approach to the radial shaft. And depending on which window you need for fracture fixation, be it proximal, middle, or distal, you can cut the portion of that line that will get you to the fracture for plate application. In this scenario, I can feel the biceps tendon right here, and here is the uh, FCR crossing the wrist crease. Again, biceps tendon, and I'm just gonna connect those two lines. And then we can cut anywhere along this to get to our fracture. We're gonna to suppose today that we have a mid shaft fracture, which is probably the most common type of forearm fracture that we see. So for a standard approach, uh, if this is our fracture line, I'm gonna probably use somewhere along this incision from this arrow to this arrow. So Superficial dissection is through the skin and will come down on the uh, fascia of the forearm. The windows of the volar Henry approach are going to be uh, mostly between uh, the FCR and the brachioradialis. And what you'll see is that the radial artery lies deep to the brachioradialis, which is on the radial side of that retraction. Uh, and then it'll come out between that interval, brachioradialis and flexor carpi radialis, and it'll run uh, just adjacent to the FCR tendon. Now, a lot of surgeons are very comfortable down in the distal portion of this approach uh, because of the uh, pro approach, the standard approach for the distal radius fracture. The classic Henry approach is actually on the radial side of the radial artery between brachioradialis and radial artery the whole way. Uh, a lot of surgeons now, after the standardization of the modified Henry for the volar approach to the distal radius, will use the same distal window that they use for their distal radius. So a lot of times you'll be on the ulnar side of the radial artery, if that's your preference and what you're comfortable with between the radial artery and the FCR tendon. And that's what I tend to do. So to demonstrate the anatomy at that area, I'm gonna extend my incision down along the FCR so that you can see anatomy that you're familiar with from distal radius fixation. And we can see deep to us is gonna be the FCR tendon. And again, radial artery will be on the radial side of that. And as we get up more proximally, brachioradialis and the flexor carpi radialis muscle bellies will be together. And that is gonna be our interval to get down to the, to the uh, radial shaft. So I'm incising the fascia and the epimesium of the muscle. And if you're on the FCR tendon, you know that you're safe because the radial artery is going to be just radial to you. So if we look up in the proximal aspect of the wound, this is brachioradialis and this is flexor carpi radialis. And this should be the radial artery between the two. Usually neurovascular structures will be uh, surrounded by uh, 
perivascular or perineural fat. So when you see that stripe of fat, know that you're close to those structures and that's the time to take your dissection a little bit more carefully. As long as you dissect parallel to structures at risk, that is safest. So when I see that fat, I'm going to spread longitudinally and protect the neurovascular structures. You're going to see that there are perforators that go from the radial artery to both the flexor corpi radialis and to the uh, brachioradialis. And you can take the vessel either way, depending on which side has fewer perforators. Sometimes this dissection is done for you by the fracture itself with disruption of the soft tissues from deep. So we're going to continue our dissection here. And again, this is flexor carpi radialis. Here is our radial artery. I'm going to continue the dissection distally. These are some of the perforating vessels from the radial artery going over to the flexor carpi radialis that would need to be ligated and coagulated. And the lab here will simulate that. Other structures at risk uh, in this approach, the superficial branch of the radial nerve is also under the cover of brachioradialis and will be exiting uh, from under the cover of that about eight centimeters above the uh, wrist articular surface and that typically is a little bit more dorsal but those branches can start to come volar as they exit from the cover of brachioradialis. If we look down in our distal dissection first, it's an area that most people are a little bit more comfortable with. and they're familiar with it from the approach for the distal radius. So what you'll see is that the flexor pollicis longus is going to be coming off the, uh, its origin at the radius, and the pronator quadratus muscle is just deep and distal to that. So this is a familiar area. Here is the volar aspect of the radial shaft, and this is the FPL muscle above it. You can see the flexion of the uh, thumb at the IP joint with uh, pulling on the FPL. Uh, so again, here is FPL. This is pronator quadratus along the volar aspect. And here is radial shaft uh, distally within the forearm. Here's that volar aspect of the radial shaft. And this is the FPL muscle here. So here's the volar aspect of the distal radius. And again, for orientation, here's FPL, pronator quadratus against my key elevator here. I'm gonna switch the retractor so we can see more up into the middle window. So this tendon that is coming into view right at the mid portion of the radius is gonna be the, the pronator teres and it is a point of firm attachment of the uh, pronator teres from its origin on the medial epicondyle uh, to the radial shaft and it is uh, one of the major pronators of the uh, forearm in addition to the pronator quadratus distally. With that firm attachment of the tendon to the radial shaft, it is really common to have your fracture be adjacent to that pronator teres insertion. So I find that very important in doing my reduction because if the fracture is just distal to the insertion, I know that the unopposed pull of the pronator teres is going to pronate my proximal piece. So my reduction maneuver is going to be to supinate it 
uh, back into its original configuration. If the fracture site is just proximal to that pronator teres, I know my distal fragment is going to be pronated away from its normal orientation because of that, again, unopposed pull of the pronator teres. Uh, so I'm going to supernate my distal piece in, the, in that uh, setting. So let's just clear off the volar side of the uh, radius so we can see it a little more clearer. There are two ways to handle the uh, pronator teres. Uh, some people will do a Z lengthening cut and repair the tendon. I typically will elevate the pronator teres uh, and will uh, release it at its maximal insertion. And to do that, you do the action that the muscle has, which is pronate, and you can get around the corner and you can see the fibers reach around towards the radial and dorsal sides of the uh, radial shaft and you can release it at its uh, most distal aspect. So I'm just coming through that insertion. Again, it's, it's uh, the choice and preference of some people to do a Z lengthening and just repair it at the end back over your plate and I think either are fine. So this is the pronator teres insertion. And for exposure, I'm gonna just extend a little bit up here so we can easily see uh, what's going on in the deep dissection level. And we'll continue that dissection between FCR and brachioradialis just a little bit proximally. A lot of this dissection ends up being done for you in the traumatic scenario where there's a fracture underneath. Again, back to my periosteal elevator to help reveal the volar surface of the radius where our plate is going to go. As with all fracture care, you want to take, uh, take your time and pay attention to the vascular supply of the fracture fragments so that you don't unnecessarily strip them from their periosteal attachments, but because this is where the plate is going, we're gonna to need to expose this surface of the bone. And if we were to go uh, significantly more proximal, we would run into the supernator coming in. I think you can just get a hint of those fibers up here, the supernator uh, coming into its proximal attachment on the radial shaft. We'll select the appropriate plate for the fracture configuration that we're looking at and they're available in various sizes ranging from six holes in length up to 16 holes in length. This is the eight hole plate which is uh, appropriate I find for a number of the standard mid shaft fractures. Uh, probably the one that I use the most often. Uh, when you're choosing your plate and the location of the plate proximal and distal and the length that you need be mindful that the center of the bow on the plate has to match the center of the anatomic bow of the radius. So we'll place our plate in the appropriate position. There are plate holding clamps in the set that again have a serrated side for the aspect of the bone that's away from the plate and a, a belly that sits right on the plate itself and I find these very useful in holding the plate reduced to the, uh, to the radius. The other option is to use a plate tack uh, to hold the, the plate in place. All right, so now we will uh, put a non-locking bicortical screw in, in this case, we're gonna put it on the distal side of our fracture. Uh, and it will put it in in neutral to get the plate compressed to the bone. So in order to get compression on the opposite side, 
uh, we will drill in one of the oblong holes that are appropriate and you have two options. You can see on this green gold guide, the green side is the, is the central uh, drill hole which would go for a neutral screw. We're gonna put this in compression. So it's gonna be eccentric away from the fracture site so that we can generate the compression through the oblong hole. You can see that the hole in the middle of this guide on the gold side is eccentric. And if you point the arrow towards the fracture, you will be uh, eccentric away from the fracture such that you generate compression as that head moves the plate away from the fracture. The other option is to use a standard guide and just place yourself eccentrically within the oblong hole. And uh, this green gold guide is my preference. And as the head engages the edge of that oblong hole, it translates the plate away from the fracture site and generates compression of the, the bone across that fracture. Now we could, if we wanted to get more compression, put a second one in in this other oblong. The only technical aspect of doing that is as you're putting the screw in, before the head engages the plate and starts to translate the plate distally, you'd need to loosen the screw that you already placed on this side to allow travel of the plate and then retighten it. Lastly, if locking screws are necessary because of the fracture pattern or the bone quality, uh, you can use the same 2.8 millimeter drill bit for placement of a locking screw and we'll demonstrate that. Now one of the nice things about this set is that the drill bit for the non-locking and the locking screws is exactly the same. So if you're unsure whether you needed a locking screw in this hole, you could put the guide on, the tower on, so that you preserve the alignment of the locking screw and try a non-locking screw because it's the same drill bit. If you needed to then switch it out to a locking screw because of comminution or osteoporotic bone, you'd still be able to do that without having to make a new drill pass. The window within the locking tower uh, can allow you to read your depth right off of the drill bit here. And in this case, we'll do a 14 locking screw. Uh, you can see here that we have three screws in place at this time, uh, but we would get appropriate fixation bicortically on both sides of the fracture. Uh, appropriate fixation is given the fracture pattern once you have completed your fixation, full length AP films of the forearm and full length lateral films are obtained to make sure that uh, the anatomic bow is restored in both planes. You can see on the AP view here that the anatomic plate matches the anatomic bow of the radius. And on the lateral view, you can see that the dorsal bow is also respected by this anatomic plate and is also restored by the application of, of this plate with appropriate fixation. The last thing that I do clinically is I will always make sure that the patient has full pronosupination. So I clinically put them through a range of motion of pronation and supination. There's maximal pronation, maximal supination. I'm holding the elbow to make sure that it's coming through the forearm. And once I'm clinically happy with that, uh, we can do our standard closure. We do not close the fascia in the form and we would just close the subcutaneous uh, soft tissues of the skin uh, with the dermis and uh, interrupted nylon sutures or whatever your uh, skin suture of choice is.